Well, hello everyone and welcome to the fourth lecture of the five-part 2021 Legends of Simpson faculty lecture series. This virtual series features some of Simpson's most beloved emeriti faculty presenting on topics near and dear to their hearts. Today, you'll hear from Dr. Pat Singer, a professor of biology at Simpson for over 36 years. It's now my pleasure and honor to introduce a true Simpson legend, Dr. Pat Singer, as she presents my 40-year romp through DNA. Perfect. Thank you. I don't think I'm a, I'm a legend in the sense that I'm not old enough, but, but anyway, but I was, I was um, happy to be asked, um, and I had a really good time thinking about the, um, how DNA has changed over the past 40 years. So I am going to, uh, and I, in order to, for you to understand some of these changes, I, I am going to use a, um, a slide, a PowerPoint slideshow. Okay, and there we go. Okay, you should now see the um, PowerPoint slideshow. So I decided on my 40 year romp through DNA be, um, just because it gave me an opportunity to think about um, my time at Simpson. Uh, I think this, photo, this, uh, this artwork is actually appropriate of my understanding of DNA through the 40 years, because just when you think you got a good handle on it, boo, everything explodes and you have to start fresh with a new understanding of DNA. And um, I think if I could rename this talk, I was thinking, oh, this is not a great name. If I could rename this talk, it would be, Oh, I got to go to use this. Almost everything I taught is wrong. And so one of the things we're going to be looking at is, is what did I use to teach and why is that wrong in, with, in what we know today? Okay, so I'm going to start out with the, just the basics. I pretty, I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with DNA, but just to make sure we're on the same page, I wanted to point out that... DNA is double-stranded, and it is made up of four bases, guanine. I'm going to change this to a laser just a second. Okay, guanine, adenine, thymine, and cytosine. The sequence of these four bases is the basis of our genetic information. Adenine's uh, base pair with thymines. I was going to say always, but for ge in genetics, there's always a uh, except. Um, guanine's base pair with cytosines. All of our cells, we have about 6.2 billion base pairs of DNA in each of our cells, and all of our cells contain the same genetic information. So a chromosome is a very long stretch of DNA, and it contains somewhere between uh, about 70 genes on the X chromosome up to thousands of genes on the larger chromosomes. We will look briefly at what a gene is and we will look briefly at what a chromosome consists of. But here's what amazes me. All of the genetic information in living organisms, whether they're plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, viruses, which really aren't living, is made up of these four bases. That is mind blowing to think about infinite diversity created by simply four bases. The central dogma of gene expression organizes everything that we think about in genetics. I remember the first time I saw this um, central dogma of gene expression because it was just simply beauty. DNA codes for protein. Back when I was introduced to the central dogma, um, this is exactly what we saw. But I am going to show a different central dogma later. In the process of gene expression, Double-stranded DNA is converted into a single strand of RNA that we call messenger RNA, okay? In the process of reading one of the two strands of DNA to create a messenger RNA is called transcription, okay? Then the bases 
uh, the sequence of bases in the RNA are translated into a protein. And that's how it works. And while I'm on this slide, this would be a good time to talk about uh, very briefly the different kinds of uh, COVID vaccines. Uh, if uh, both Pfizer and Moderna are messenger RNA vaccines. Um, the messenger RNA is artificially manufactured by a machine. It codes for a little bit of the spike protein of the COVID virus, and it gets translated into the protein, and then your immune system is working and responding to the protein. If you get AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson, what you're getting is a DNA. The DNA is coded uh, is carried or code, coated in a um, uh, adenovirus. And so the DNA that is given in the AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has to first be transcribed into messenger RNA. And then the messenger RNA, which codes for, again, the piece of the spike is translated into a bit of the spike protein. Uh, I've, over the, the years that I have been at Simpson, uh, two intriguing questions just drove my interest in genetics. And I want to go through them because they're going to, they explain how I understand the changes of, in the DNA over the years. One is, how does a gene, gene get turned on? We don't make, our cells don't make every, or turn on every single gene. Okay. For example, insulin is made in the pancreas, but the insulin gene is turned off in the liver. So how do you turn on the gene, uh, insulin gene in the pancreas? That's one question, and that's a question that we answer in genetics. Uh, another question that really uh, intrigues me is what signals a gene to be turned on anyway? Um, and that's actually a, a topic that we cover in cell biology. So most of my um, interest in DNA has not been really structural, but functional. So we're going to not go all the way back 40 years. Um, we're gonna start with the OJ Simpson trial, which began uh, late in 1994. So just to remind you, OJ Simpson was accused of slashing and stabbing to death his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her boyfriend, Ron Goldman. OJ was, was also slashed in the struggle. Not only was OJ Simpson on trial for the murder of Nicole Brown uh, Simpson and Ron Goldman, um, DNA was also on trial because this was the first time um, a high profile trial in which DNA evidence was presented. The jury endured four day, a four-day course on DNA and DNA fingerprinting. Um, I've read different numbers of blood samples, but um, uh, the law, uh, different law uh, um, examinations of the trial recount that there were 45 blood samples taken from the crime scene. Of the 29 samples, OJ's blood, um, oh, of the 45 samples, oh, uh, 29 contained OJ Simpson's blood. And of those 29 samples, three of those samples contained OJ's blood mixed with either Nicole Brown Smith's blood or Ron Gold Goldman's blood or both. Okay, and I should mention that um, the crime scene consisted of um, the site where the murder happened, that um, it consisted of the famous white Bronco, the famous black gloves, and um, O.J. Simpson's socks. Uh, the uh, blood found at the crime scene matched O.J. Simpson's blood and was tested multiple way in multiple ways. And there was a one in 170 million chance that the blood didn't belong to O.J. Simpson, but in fact belonged to somebody else. Blood found on O.J. Simpson's socks matched Nicole Brown Simpson's blood. There was about a one in 6.8 billion chance that the blood belonged to somebody else, not Nicole Brown Smith. 
And that seemed to, that seemed surprising to me when the jurors decided, no, there's still that possibility that OJ wasn't at this crime scene. And there was still a possibility that um, Nicole Brown Simpson and OJ Simpson were not together the night of the trial. Murder. Or the night of the murder. And so it reminds me of this movie. I, I'm sure a lot of us have seen the movie Dumb and Dumber. Um, and there's a scene where we are, where um, Jim Carrey's character asks a beautiful woman, what are the chances you'll go out with me? One in a million? Oh, so you're saying there's a chance? And that's kind of how the jury uh, responded to the blood um, samples and the DNA fingerprinting. I'm not so sure this would happen today. As a matter of fact, um, companies have, have really grown up thinking about, thinking of, or knowing that we have a much more familiarity with DNA and confidence in DNA. I just got my blood results back from an Ancestry DNA. Um, there's also Chrome, uh, 23andMe. So, so people are using DNA sequencing strategies or D and DNA uh, blood fingerprinting strategies today. Oops. Every once in a while that doesn't work. Yes, it's like, okay. So one of the things that has changed during the, um, between OJ Simpson's trial and today is the number of genes. Back uh, in the 19th, this is a graph that shows how many genes, protein coding genes did we think was in our human genome? And, and the x-axis shows the year. Um, and it turns out that if we look back in the 1960s, we thought that there were 6.7 million genes in our genome. And this was a figure that was pre purely based on the amount of DNA we knew we had in human cells, okay? But if we kind of follow along through um, in time to about the time of the O.J. Simpson trial, that number had dropped down to 100,000, about 100,000 um, different genes. And I used to teach that we have about 100, 150,000 to 200,000 genes. And of course, this was about the time of the O.J. Simpson trial. Um, and, and the reason for that estimate of 150,000 or 100,000 genes is we know, we knew at the time we could make 100,000 proteins or 150,000 proteins. And we use the central dogma, one gene codes for one protein. And so it was a purely logical conclusion that we have the same number of genes as we do proteins. But as I've learned over the years, scientists should never trust logic. So when the Human Genome Project was launched, we witnessed a precipitous drop in the number of genes in the human genome. I remember um, on my second sabbatical in 1999, chromosome 21 had just been sequenced and it was surprisingly gene poor. And so our estimate dropped to, the, the national estimate dropped to, well, maybe we have about 80,000 different genes. But as the chromosomes were sequenced, the numbers of genes continued to drop and to further and drop further. So if you look at today, this, is a, this number of 21,000 is a slightly outdated estimate. It's currently, we have about 20,000 different protein coding genes. Okay, and this is kind of a shocking number because a fruit fly has about 12,000 genes. So we have less than twice as many genes as a fruit fly. And it was this conundrum that has driven a lot of gene research in the 20th century. So I want to go back to the central dogma 
of gene expression. Because one of the things we want to talk about is, is how in the world can you have a, a genome that consists of 20,000 genes, but you can make hundreds of, you can make 100,000 or so proteins. Okay, so, so I'm gonna expand the central document just a little bit. So we know that um, when DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA, the initial copy of that messenger RNA is non-functional. For lots of different reasons, it cannot be translated into a protein. So we call that non-functional DNA pre-mRNA. It has to be processed into messenger RNA before it can be translated into protein. Okay, well, apparently, um, let's see how I gotta do this. Well, it now turns out that you can start out with one pre-RNA and from that one pre-RNA you can make multiple different kinds of messenger RNA. Some which contain the same sequence, some which contain vastly different sequences. And each of those messenger RNAs can be code, uh, can code for a different protein. And there are some magnificent examples of this process going on. We've also learned that Sometimes the gene can make multiple pre-messenger RNAs. And th that pre-messenger RNA can make other kinds of messenger RNAs, and that can make more kind, and that can make also generate more proteins. So on the average, we think that um, a typical protein coding gene in DNA, uh, protein coding gene can code for it for as uh, at least um, six proteins. Some genes code for many more. Some genes code for only one protein. This process that I've shown you here accounts for only 1% of your genome. So when I teach genetics, we're really thinking about only 1% of the genome. DNA can also code for other kinds of RNA. Okay, um, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA, we've known that for a long time. If you want some really, really fun um, RNAs, micro RNA, I'm gonna also point out long non-coding RNA, probably uh, just, just an absolutely fascinating topic. Okay, so now that really complicates the, mess, the, the definition of a gene. What is a gene? And it's probably one of the most loosey-goosey definitions I've, you know, I've ever heard. So I'm not even going to attempt to define a gene um, in this particular case. Okay, I'm going to switch topics a little bit. So we just looked at um, um, what, what we've learned since uh, OJ, since O.J. Simpson's trial, but I want to uh, take a look at a, a different topic that's uh, recently emerged. I want to go back to um, the Dutch hunger winter um, back in 1944 and 1945 and how that informs us today about genetics. So, so um, the Netherlands during um, World War II was occupied only partially by the Nazis. Um, and it was tended to be the northern part where we had, where there were some rather large cities. Um, the Nazis controlled the import of food into the region. They essentially cut off the uh, movement of food and other supplies into the German controlled regions. As a result, there was a tremendous food shortage in um, those northern regions of the Netherlands and the calor daily caloric intake dropped to about 500 calories. About 18,000 people starved to death during that winter. So children who were conceived during the hunger winter were underweight, as we see in, in this picture of a, a child born after the hunger winter. Um, as adults, um, they tended to suffer from a number of chronic diseases, such as obesity, 
schizophrenia, the development of insulin resistance and type two diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia, okay? And I'm going to focus on, uh, in, in this story, on uh, insulin resistance and type two diabetes. In both insulin resistance and type two diabetes, blood sugar levels tend to run pretty high. When a person has insulin resistance, there's ample insulin available in the bloodstream, but the cells cannot respond to it. Okay, and type two diabetes is when there's not enough insulin in the bloodstream. And so the blood sugar levels remain high. Um, certain drugs like sulfonylureas can boost the amount of insulin secreted by the pancreas, okay? But we need to, and, to, and to bring this eventually back to genetics, we need to describe one of the proteins that a, a gene codes for. Okay. And this protein is a, a glucose transporter. So if you have high blood pressure, uh, blood sugar, there's really only two ways you can get rid of the excess glucose in your blood. One way is you can simply pee it out. And the other way is your cells can take up that glucose, um, bring the glucose from the bloodstream in, into the cells but glucose doesn't cross into the cell by itself. It requires a glucose transporter and the glucose transporter is a protein. So it's coded for by a gene. So, in, so um, the glucose transporters, like all transporters on your cell surfaces, um, alternate between two shapes. One shape has a glucose binding site on the outside of the cell where glucose can bind. The binding of glucose stimulates uh, a shift in the shape of the protein to bring the glucose binding site to the inside of the cell and glucose is released, okay? All glucose transporters work this way, okay? We have a variety of different glucose transporters, okay? Um, the brain cells, have a glucose transporter, in fact, they have the one called GLUT1, that it works extremely efficiently and works even when the blood sugar levels in the blood are very, very low. Other tissues like the kidneys, um, the liver, or the intestines have glucose transporters that work very poorly at low blood sugar levels. So you can imagine the purpose of this difference in glucose carriers is to give the brain preferential access to the blood sugar. In fasting conditions, the brain always gets the glucose. Glucose transporters in muscle cells work pretty well, even at low blood sugar levels, but not quite as good as the brain's glucose transporters. But we've got a lot of skeletal muscle compared to the brain. The brain has to compete with the skeletal muscles for the glucose in the blood. Okay. But not to worry. The blood, the body has a strategy to ensure that the brain doesn't have to compete with the skeletal muscles for, for sugar in the blood. The skeletal muscles have a special uh, glucose transporter called GLUT4. And in this picture, these are the GLUT4s, okay? These two um, oval things. When blood sugar levels are pretty low, the muscles aren't taking up much glucose because the glucose transporters aren't on the cell surface. They're inside the cell and it's not possible for them to bring in the glucose from outside the cell. So the brain gets the glucose. When glucose levels are high, insulin is released. The insulin binds to the receptor 
that creates a chain reaction that, that causes these GLUT4 transporters to move up to the cell surface, and now they can take in the excess glucose. Adults, so the adults who were conceived during the hunger winter don't have a sufficient number of GLUT4 proteins in their, in their cells. So in these people, when blood sugar levels are high and insulin binds to the receptors, there's no GLUT4 to bring up to the surface to draw the glucose into the cell. And this is a perfect example of insulin resistance. Insulin is present, it's binding to the receptors on skeletal muscles, but the cells can't respond because there's no GLUT4. So the question becomes, why isn't there enough GLUT4? Okay, it's extremely brilliant that the GLUT, that in during uh, fetal development, the GLUT4 gene gets turned off so that the brain during development is the one organ that gets the glucose. The inactivation of the GLUT4 gene in people who were um, conceived during the hunger winters is a beautiful example of epigenetics. Hands down, epigenetics is my favorite topic in genetics. So what is epigenetics? There's actually also not an extremely good definition, but we're gonna work on this one. These are heritable changes in the phenotype, in other words, the characteristic of a person, such as type 2 diabetes. Okay, the person didn't, used, didn't have diabetes, but now the person does have type 2 diabetes. And these heritable changes involve, um, do not involve changes in DNA sequence. Heritable means, in a scary sense, that these changes can be passed on to the next generation. We know these changes are passed on when the cells divide, so each, of new, each new cell inherits the changes, but we now know that heritable also means the next generation of humans. Epigenetics is a, a relatively new topic um, to us in genetics. If you look, it, any papers published on genetics didn't really start appearing robustly, and let's say till about 20, you know, somewhere in the uh, late teen or in the late hundreds, uh, 2005, 2006, 2007, and look how it exploded. Okay, it is a hot topic in genetics these days. Um, I've been even seeing um, research done on, on COVID virus induced um, epigenetic changes in cells. And I think that will be a hot topic for quite a while. Okay, so we need to kind of explore two mechanisms of epigenetics, um, but we're not gonna explore all of them, even though I would love to. First, we have to look at how in the world is that, is that DNA organized into um, chromosomes. And this, we knew this back from the 19, late 1970s, um, this structure of DNA. And I used to explain in class that, you know, we have over six feet of DNA and it has to be packed into a microscopic nucleus so that we can't even see it under the microscope. And the only way to presume or to imagine how do you how do you package six feet of DNA into a microscopic nucleus is to think there's got to be a regular way of folding the DNA. And there is, um, and it has to do with um, proteins, these yellow things called histones. Okay. And um, I, my first course in, in graduate school was about histones. And back then we thought that uh, we know that D histones are very protective of the DNA. So surely the histones wrap themselves around the DNA 
And lo and behold, no, it's the other way around. DNA wraps around the histones. And each one of these yellow lozenges consists of eight histone proteins with two um, wrappings of DNA, 148 bases. Okay, so that shrinks the length if you wrap your DNA into a round histone. I'm going to call them octomers, um, octomer meaning eight proteins in this case. Okay, and then the beads on a string structure coils itself, and then it coils some more, and it coils some more until you can see a chromosome. Okay, so I used to teach that this is the purpose of histones is to compact six feet of DNA into a microscopic nucleus and, that, and to protect the DNA from degradation. And while those things are true, I mean, they're not false, the real, the real function of the histones is they are the gatekeepers of genes. The histones control access to the genes. So if you want to turn on a gene, you have to work on the histones. You have to modify the histones so that they let go of the DNA um, so you can transcribe the DNA. Okay, and we're gonna take a look at a couple of mechanisms about how this is, some of this is done. So one, one mechanism, it was probably the first epigenetic discovery uh, was that sometimes the DNA itself, now we're not talking about the histones, but you go back to the DNA and sometimes it gets methylated. It doesn't get methylated randomly. It gets methylated, the, the DNA gets methylated only on cytosines that precede a guanine. Okay. What's methylated? Huh? What's methylated? Oh, okay. Oh, my husband asked me what methylated is. Um, methylation is just a, um, a chemical addition to DNA. Okay. A methyl group is added to the DNA. And in fact, it's added to the cytosine. And the fact that the two strands um, are methylated um, during replication the methylation of the, each strand that serves as a template for a new strand also carries the pattern of methylation. So the methylation pattern can re be repeated. These changes in DNA cannot be identified by DNA sequencing. So when I got my DNA back from DNA ancestry, um, they couldn't tell me which of the DNA sequences were methylated and which ones weren't because they all you know, methylated cytosines sequence just the same way as unmethylated cytosines. But methylated cytosines are very potent gene active inactivators. They will turn off a gene and it's almost impossible to get that gene to turn back on. Okay, so GLUT4 gene could have been methylated. That's one way to, to um, cut back on the amount of GLUT4 is methylate the GLUT4 gene so that it can't be activated anymore. Okay, you could also um, modify the histones. Okay, and that probably that discovery came a little bit later. Okay, in order to even turn on a gene, in order, and really in order for the histones to let go of their DNA that they're holding so closely, is you have to add a chemical group called an, ac uh, an acetyl group. If you can't, if you don't put an acetyl group on the histones around the gene, the gene is off. Okay, so turning on a gene requires, we got to change the histones around that gene. Histones can be methylated, okay, with the addition of methyl groups, just like DNA can be methylated. And the methylation can lead to sometimes gene inactivation or sometimes gene activation, depending on where the methyl group is attached to in the histones, okay? So one of the things, uh, so GLUT4 gene could be turned off um, by uh, blocking acetylation of the gene or by act, adding the right 
kind of methylation to the gene. I got to watch the time. I think I'm running over a little bit. Okay, I'm going to go five more minutes, I think, um, or hopefully less. Well, it turns out, much to my surprise, that in infant, that in adults who were conceived during the hunger winters, um, their GLUT4 gene was turned off by changes to the histones. So the histones couldn't be acetylated around the GLUT4 gene and the histones were methylated in an inhibitory way around the GLUT4 gene. And this, these histone changes persisted throughout the life of those kids, or people who were conceived during the hunger winters. I'm gonna skip this slide for lack of time. One of, the, one of the topics that I think is important to understand is that other kinds of childhood stresses change the epigenetics of the brain. Um, these stresses could be physical abuse, uh, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, psychological abuse. They could be neglect, warfare, you know, just a whole number um, you know, of different kinds of stresses. And as the child grows and if the stresses aren't um, removed, an increasing number of genetic epigenetic changes occur both to the DNA and to the histones, which cause increasing problems in um, the people who grew up in the in when stress was high during their childhood years, I think again the, the scary thing about um, these epigenetic changes is that we see now that they are passed on to their children and can be passed on even further. So I feel sometimes I need to apologize to my children for the epigenetic legacy. I've given them, okay? We, all, we can also say with certainty now that um, there are significant epigenetic changes in the brains of African-Americans who face um, daily microaggressions every time they walk out, out of their house. Their epigenetic, um, uh, epigenetics changes in their brain and they have very uh, low ability to manage stress. So I do want to end by saying um, something about epigenetics. We are our epigenome, not our genome. And I am gonna turn off my slide share and see if you have any questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Singer. That was very, very informative and hopefully in five to 10 years, it won't all be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it will be. <laughs> And we will open it up to questions now, and you can use the question and answer uh, to send those in, and then I will ask those questions of Dr. Singer. Uh, while you're typing those in, I do have a question, and it relates to that uh, topic of everything I taught is wrong. Um, do you feel like we have gotten to a point with technology and, and our research abilities that what we know now will remain true for many, many years into the future? Or do you think that that technology and research will actually mean that we'll change what we know even at a quicker pace? That's a great question because I would have bet 10 years ago, we would have answered that question, yes. You know, um, but the, the technology is, is changing. I think a geneticist today cannot do much work without, um, the work of a computer scientist without collaborating with computer scientists. And we're now at the ability to look at uh, single cell changes. And, and that's some, been some of the questions that have been asked about the COVID uh, virus and, and what kinds of cells it, it in, um, can infect. Um, so we're, we're looking at, as the technology develops, we can ask teeny, you know, questions about teeny weeny cells, but, you can't do that anymore without without a um, some sort of computer program. So I think no, we can't. I, I don't think that question's answerable. I think I'll I won't be surprised with surprises, but I'll love them. 
<laughs> yeah. We have a question here that actually relates back to COVID. If one DNA can be transcribed to multiple pre-RNAs and each pre-RNA can be transcribed to multiple proteins, is that hopeful, frightening, or both in terms of the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca vaccines? Are there more likely to be unforeseen consequences of taking the vaccine? Um. I think if it, if it was me, I, I would I would think that um, since that you know that that transcription of DNA and to make multiple RNAs is probably a great um, amplification that can give you a robust response. Uh, I think the thing I I think we all need to remember is that the only thing that's being produced by the vaccine is a small piece of the spike protein. So nothing that can, you know, so, so it's enough to um, activate the immune system to make antibodies against the, the virus, um, but it is not the virus. Um, so I don't think there's any COVID consequences. And I don't know if I answered that person's question, but I wouldn't mind a, I wouldn't mind a vaccine that can be amplified by the cells. Thank you. Can you share more clinical examples of epigenetic re, uh, regulation and what is the future of epigenetic research? <laughs> and, and again, I, it's, it's probably way open about what the future is. But yes, if I had time, those slide I skipped, I was going to talk about um, epigenetic changes in cancer. Um, tumor suppressor genes, okay, are genes whose um, protein product blocks or suppresses the formation of cancer. Those are um, turned off, those genes are often turned off by DNA methylation. And it happens early in the development of cancer. So I think there, and, and there have been some important diagnostic um, attempts to look at a person's methylome. Okay, so we got a genome, a proteome, and now we have an ep uh, methylome and look and, and look at that as a way of uh, early diagnosis of cancers. And then the question is, can we block the methylation and reactivate the genes? And I've seen that in cancer research. It's, it's just, let's not let those um, genes get methylated. Can we turn on that? Can we turn that gene back on? Okay, I don't believe there's any other questions out there now, so I'm actually going to take the opportunity to ask one. And do you reflect back, is there a specific research project that you worked on with Simpson students that really stands out as something that you felt really made a difference um, or was very, very exciting in your time here at Simpson? Yes, I think I have, I'd have to go back to the work with uh, Simba Stanton. So on my... On my last sabbatical, was, uh, uh, my second sabbatical, I took a full year and I got a full year's worth um, out of it. But on my last sabbatical, um, I brought, my goal was to bring a project back to Simpson. And I started, I looked at, um, worked with, um, D, at DMU, I brought up, we got a grant to purchase a real-time PCR thermal cycler. So I brought that up because I was going to learn how to use it. And I did the research on Simvastatin. So some of you take Simvastatin, I bet. Um, Zocor is the brand name for the drug Simvastatin. It lowers cholesterol, but it also um, blocks cell division and promotes cell death. So wouldn't this be a great cancer drug? And so, um, and it has been used as a cancer drug. And the, and the question that I started researching at DMU and brought back to Simpson was, um, we were looking at cell death. What genes are turned on or turned off in response to simvastatin? And then we started in the biochem laboratory looking at how are these genes being uh, turned on or turned off? Thank you. We have had a few more come in. Can you elaborate on your metaphor that you used at the end, the last slide? We are our epigenetics. Um, well, 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 one of the things is that, you know, you can't detect, you can, you can do all of the genome sequencing you want, but that doesn't really help a person understand how did that, how did that person develop schizophrenia? Because epigenetic 
unless you do a brain biopsy, you know, so uh, you don't know. Um, so I, as, as the years have gone by, I find DNA to be um, somewhat boring because all of the control and all of the who we are, are happening with, um, on our histones. And they're happening with DNA methylation and they're happening with other aspects of epigenetics. So we're given a DNA sequence, but how we use that DNA sequence, how we use that to become who we are um, is really an epigenetic mechanism. All right. Uh, the epigenetic trauma response can be passed to children and grandchildren. That's right. Aside from societal change, which is vital, is there anything that can be done? What should the scientific community be trying to do or discover? I think we, we, as we discover that, I really think, for example, um, that guides us to appropriate prenatal, the importance of prenatal care, number one. Um, we also th have to think about child development, number two. Um, and, and try to, you know, just, just try to understand what causes the, the inactivation, the genetic inactivation of um, the stress response. And how does that play out? How do you teach people to, whose um, stress genes have been turned off? How do you teach them to, to design new ways to cope? We don't, because epigenetics is so new, I don't, I don't think we know the extent to which these epigenetic changes are necessarily passed on to other to the next generation. We know that they can be, and in some cases are, but we don't know how far. We don't know how many generations it'll go. It's it's too new. Um, but but it, it seems to me that oh my gosh, prenatal care is important. Um, child development is very important. Um, Man, uh, understanding that people have epigenetic secrets in their brain that we can't see, but that certainly can influence how they cope and how they respond to different things. I think it, it changes how we interact with one another and ought to change how we interact with one another. All right, and one final comment and, and question. This is from John Arthur who says, I was in your first cell biology class when you came to Simpson and boy, have things changed. He said, this is very helpful. So will we come up with cures for cancer in the near future? And if so, what, method it, what methods are looking the most promising? Uh, yeah, that's a tough one. Well, I think some of the immunogenetics it look, is, is looking promising. Um, I think DNA drugs, I, you know, are not very promising. Here's what I think has to be promising is, is um, drugs that, that select, that are selectively inactivating the cancer cells um, rather than the normal cells. And DNA drug, DNA-based drugs are not that. Um, some of, some of the other drugs that we use that block cell division, that's not a good drug, you know, but, but the ones that can pick on a phenotype or a genotype that's unique to the cancer and go after that. But I think a lot right now is in the area of immunology and I'm not an immu immunologist, so I wish I could answer that question, but I can't. And, and I am, I'm embarrassed that, that you were in my very first genetic, uh, cell biology class. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much for being with us, Dr. Singer. We, we greatly appreciate it on behalf of everyone uh, that participated. Thank you for uh, the lecture today. And thank you to all of our guests for being a part of this. And everyone have a great day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.